We are so thrilled to be welcoming to our virtual stage this evening, Toad's Place owner and New Haven native, Brian Phelps, and former rock critic, columnist, and writer for Billboard magazine, Randall Beach. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Randy to kick us off. Take it away, guys. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you for interested in the book. Welcome. Um, I'll just say at the outset, I'm also was a writer for the New Haven Register as well as a billboard, and that's how most people knew me. Uh, this has been a very rewarding process working with Brian the last couple of years, getting to know how he was able for 46 years to uh, pull off this amazing survival and great track record and made Toads an icon and, and continued it through the years and adopting all the changes of the business. Um, I think at the outset, I just want to know if Brian could tell everybody why did you decide you wanted to uh, write this book? I mean, you're a very busy guy. You work long, long hours. I know watching you, you're here at night, you work late into the night. So it's not easy to, to do a book on top of it. And so what, what was the motivation here? Well, basically, I've, I've been getting uh, older and older as the years go by. Now I'm uh, 67 years old. So I wanted to catch my memories before they started to fade. So I thought the best way to do that was to uh, try to get it down in writing. And uh, a couple of years ago, I had uh, a knee replacement on my right knee and I had some time. So I um, started to put ideas down and jot ideas down from stories and, um, and things that had happened in the past. I would look at lists of bands and they would um, start to uh, um, break open some uh, memory banks uh, that I have. And I'd come up with um, stories involving uh, those bands when they played Toads. And uh, that was basically it. I went, I started to um, write them all down. And um, that's how, that's how the whole process started. And you had basically when we met in September 2019, you had about 100 pages of these memories, which uh, you handed to me when we agreed we were going to collaborate. And um, it really began when Brian called me. He knew I'd worked at the register. We knew each other professionally. And uh, he said, does New Haven Register have an archive of photos I might use for a book I'm writing on Toad's Place? And I said, well, they didn't keep a very good archive through the years of all the changes of ownership. Uh, so I don't think they're going to be able to do much for you. But what is this book you're doing? And how's, how's it going? And he said, well, it's a little slow right now because uh, I went on the web and I looked up ghostwriters. And I got linked up with a company that turned out to be people from India. And uh, I know I said in my notes, they uh, came back with, uh, it, it was just worse than what I was sending out. And uh, they don't, turned out they know nothing about American popular music. They didn't know how to spell Chucky's in love. And I said, Brian, of course not. They're, they're from India. You're talking to a guy who was at your club who reviewed those shows. I've still got the clippings at home. And the, box in my closet why don't we collaborate and uh brian saw the wisdom of that we met at maury's pretty soon the group from india was gone and uh, we began our process we found a publisher that took a few months um found globe pequot receptive to the idea they realized when brian went in there and started telling the stories there's a lot going on here and it's got a lot to tell and these are entertaining stories and people are going to want to hear them so um that's basically how we, we got going, and we've been working on this for the last couple of years. And uh, the more I interviewed Brian, filling in the, the spaces and gaps in all his 100 pages of memory bank, the more uh, the more kind of fleshed out into really wonderful stories and uh, learning about how WPLR was important, uh, how Yale was important, um, the celebrities who came in, and uh, it was just um, a great learning process for me. I also learned a lot about Mike Sperndle, who was Brian's original partner and uh, who, who invited uh, Brian in in 1975, 76. October 76, okay. when I started. Way back. Yeah. So um, what what did you learn about, what did you learn through this process? So basically, uh, you've been two years now with, uh, uh, well, as far as writing a book goes, I learned it's pretty tricky and uh, pretty difficult. Uh, it takes a lot of time and thought. Uh, 
to uh, to get through it all. And um, uh, for each step we took, I realized there were many more to go. So we kept on uh, pushing away and pushing away at it. And then when we finally got uh, through the last chapter, then you started to um, um, converge with um, Globe Pequot more often. Uh, with their their folks and they would they look took a look at it and uh um made some su suggestions and then we tossed it back i guess back and forth a few times yeah. before the finished finished product came out so I, I did i definitely learned a lot about um what book writing uh is and um how difficult uh it is to uh to get to that final uh that that, that final page i did too because this is my first book and it was important that uh I saw that through and uh, had a good experience with it, and I'm just so glad that it, it's all worked out and finally it's here. And to be able to hold up the book and see it is very gratifying and it's exciting. And we're, we've sold thousands of books, and that's also it's great to get this reception and response. And uh, we, we knew we had something good, so it's but sometimes you have something good and you can't get it out there. But in this case, people are really responding because they, they love the stories. Um, I guess uh, some of the, we'll talk about some of the uh, big acts that have been here. Of course, it was the Stones and with Bob Dylan. Um, I really interested. Uh, I was at the Dylan show, and he just kept on playing and playing. And uh, by the time he was done, he'd done four sets. He'd been played for more than four hours. It was two, two o'clock, two twenty in the morning. So I asked uh, Brian, "What was it like that day? What was it?" He, Dylan was taking breaks. You go downstairs. So what what happened down there in the dressing room between those sets? Because you expect him to play for about an hour, right? That's correct. We thought he was just going to do a short show, similar to the Stones or something. And uh, we started early. And uh, when he finished his first set, um, the way he left the stage was without comment, pretty much. Normally, you're waiting for an encore. So he, when he came downstairs, I touch base with him to see what, what what was happening and uh if he was going to um go back for an encore or what he wanted to do and he basically told me we'd like to do, to do another whole set is that all right i said yeah it's fine <laughs> um let me go tell the sound man to make an announcement and uh, so we went up and made an announcement that that um, dylan and, and his band were going to be doing one more set and this went on um th two more times so we did uh, four total sets uh, with short 15, 20 minute breaks in between. And um, um, as I said, when, uh, as Randy mentioned, when uh, we finished, it was after closing time. And that worked out because um, we had collected all the drinks and uh, there were a lot of people here from the hierarchy of the New Haven Police Department. And they allowed us to uh, collect the drinks at closing time. So no one had any drinks and uh, they were just able to watch the last um, bit of, um, of Bob Dylan, and he finished up with his famous, uh, his famous song, his most famous song, um, which was um, like, a rolling like, stone. like a Rolling Stone. So um, it, it was the only way to go. At, toward the end, it was great, and, and people just stood up, and um, they couldn't believe it, and uh, they had the time of their life and lives, and um, we got through it, and uh, no problems. And uh, you, you heard him say something kind of funny when he was coming out to the fact that he, he couldn't believe that people were just sort of hanging around, right? And, and, and we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're just listening to him basically rehearse for a tour. Right. And he said to his bandmates, I thought that was hilarious because, of course, we're hanging around enjoying it. We would stay there even longer because it's Bob Dylan. And it's all a treat. It's all a bonus. And we got the good Bob. Sometimes you with Bob Dylan. You get the guy who's in a bad mood, he won't talk to the crowd, and comes back to you. For whatever reason, this night he was happy, joking, he was taking requests. Someone would call out, hey, do, do uh, Dance in the Dark by Bruce Springsteen. And Dylan kind of went, oh, okay, we can do that. And he'd confer with his bandmates, work on a few chords, turn around, play Dancing in the Dark. This is just historic. You're never going to see this again. So it was, it, was, it was a great night, and I was glad. That was before I had kids, so I could stay there the whole night. <laughs> like a lot of people <laughs> who had to leave around midnight and uh, hey, I got to get home and leave the babysitter. I just hung out there with my wife till 2.20 a.m., just having a great time, not really believing what was happening. Um, well, of course, then we can go on to uh, talk about the Rolling Stones, which was, would you say that's the most famous show that was ever at Toads? Definitely. Yeah. Without a doubt. 
the element of that was what we're doing it was not a surprise show but the stones were a surprise show so brian and the staff had to deal with secrecy how are you going to keep a lid on this when they know advance in the days in advance that uh the greatest rock and roll band in the world is coming in, and, and you don't want to have too many people because the Stones were saying, if, if we drive down York Street in our bus and we see it's out of control and thousands of people, we're going to leave. It's not going to be a show. We're not, not going to even come inside. So Brian and, and, and Mike Sperndle, who had, had a very big mouth and had to really keep it quiet, really worked on that because they were told, look, if you do blab it to people, um, there's not going to be a show because it'll be a, a mess. It'll be uh, too many people come in. You know, the Stones want to keep it to about 500 people. Right. Um, and they want to try out their material for the Steel Wheels tour. They had not played in front of anybody for eight years. They were a little nervous. Uh, so I'd say everybody was excited, but a little bit nervous. And I can only imagine how nervous Brian was all day long until he finally saw the uh, tour bus take off later that night and the police escort. So um, you want to give us a little sense of what, what that was like and to do that? Yeah, yeah. We ended up uh, keeping it secret for three weeks. And uh, when they first came in, they came in, in with a crew and they checked the whole stage out and they had to make sure it was right. And then we had a, a meeting uh, with their people in our conference room. And this was maybe between three and four weeks prior to the actual event. And then the actual event was supposed to take place on the uh, Seventh, I believe, of well, August. August fifth. 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 Week ahead of time. Right. One, Saturday night. Right. On Saturday night, um, August fifth, and uh, at the last minute, they didn't want to do it. Uh, they wanted to push it out a week. They weren't ready, so we had to um, tell the people because some people came and uh, they were tipped off by the stones, and we had to let them know that that nothing is happening tonight. We couldn't tell them anything but that. So we had an extra five hundred people in the club that night, all night drinking, waiting for the stones to go on. And that never happened, and they had to wait one more week. And after, after they waited, um, I'm not sure if they all came back, but whoever did um, um, got really lucky, and uh, um, they had the time of their of their life. Basically, one of the biggest thrills that I had was just watching the people as they walked out the door. After seeing the show, we had tons of people outside, and we were going to do uh, follow it up with a dance party um after the show was over so there were lots of people outside most of them were there um to see what's going on what all the commotion was about and if the stones were there and they they were able to hear the stones that being there because we opened all the doors up in the windows and let the sound leak outside so they they knew what was going on and then they just wanted to see people coming out when people every person that walked out that front door screamed and i i did it i saw it i saw the stones tonight each and every person was yeah and the people were just looking at them you know with their mouths open and all they wanted to do was touch anybody that just walked out of that door and saw the actual stones playing in a club because their tour was a stadium tour and toads was probably about as big as their stage was the entire club um they had a monster stage they had um, I think they had three roving um, setups. So one one group would set up, and another group, um, or maybe it was two or two or three, and another group would be there while they were playing. And while they were playing, this, the next group would be at the next date setting up. So they were able to bounce bounce around and and keep the shows moving uh, moving that way from stadium to stadium. I felt so lucky to be there. Uh, I was. Uh... You know, rock and roll critic for New Haven Register, but at that point I'd left the register. Uh, but of course, I developed some sources through the years, and uh, I was living in the West Hill part of New Haven. Uh, my wife and I, and we came home from shopping or something, and there were, it was her birthday. And I said, What do you want to do for your birthday? And she said, I don't know. And we look at the club list and see if anything's going on. And we looked through it and couldn't find anything that seemed any good. We're thinking, Boy, this is a boring town, this New Haven. And then I noticed uh, my uh, answering machine was flashing red and I said oh what's this a robot call out I guess I'll check this out and I click it and I hear there's a real good chance the Rolling Stones are going to play tonight at Toad's Place so you might want to get down there it's going to be deep throat and I look at my wife and she looked at me and said well we should go down downtown and see if this might be true and uh, 
we hustled down there and uh, when we got to the door, there was a sign that said, Sons of Bob, tonight, Sons of Bob. And uh, I said, got a, who is Sons of Bob? Who's really playing here tonight? He said, Sons of Bob, coming in, three bucks, three dollars and one cent. I said, okay, I'll pony up the money for uh, Sons of Bob and get in and find what's really happening. And when I got in, I saw the wig master of the PLJ and uh, he's standing there grinning. I said, is it true? And he said, 11 song set, 55 minutes. And then I wanted to let my friends know, but when I got downstairs, all the pay phones were taped down. You couldn't call anybody before cell phones. And we were told, you're not, you're not coming back. If you leave, we can't come back in. So, so okay, we're here and uh, we hope it's going to all happen. And uh, we'll listen to Sons of Bob. And that was a real band out of North Brantford and Brantford. And four guys were just lucky enough to get chosen by Mike Spurnville because Mick Jagger said, I want an opening act. All right, we'll give you an opening act. And Mike got Sons of Bob and they, they thought they were there for Jim Coplett's 40th birthday party at Motor. And when they got there, uh, Mike Spurnell said, do you know who you're opening for tonight? The Rolling Stones. And uh, after they covered from that shock, you know, they were told, you're not leaving. You got to stay here. You can't call all your friends. So just be cool and do your 30 minute set. And um, what a night for them too. So uh, they did a very nice set and people were very polite. We were happy to Okay, we'll listen to Sons of Bob for half an hour. They're a good band. And <laughs> they got off stage and uh, they're back They're back in the stairway and suddenly clump, clump, clump. Here come the Rolling Stones running down the stairs off of the, the bus. And they said, oh my God, you're, hi, Mick. Hi, Keith. How you doing? He said, oh, fine, good. How's the crowd up there? How's the crowd? Oh, oh good, good. And Ronnie Wood, the guitarist, said, uh, he's smoking a cigarette. He's a little nervous. They haven't played for anybody eight years. And he said, well, how did it go up there? And and the sons of Bob said, well, good, good, it's a good crowd. And Ronnie went, do you, do you think they're going to like us? Do you think they're going to be into us? He said, are you kidding? You're the Rolling Stones. You're going to tear the roof off the place. Of course they did. But this was, it was an endearing thing because they didn't know after eight years off the road, do we still have the juice? Do they still like us? Yeah. And then they introduced some new songs like Mixed Emotions for the first time ever. And Mike, uh, Mick said, I hope you like this song. We never played this before for anybody. And when we liked it, he was so happy. You know, thank you, Bill. You're too kind. My goodness. So that that was this, the, the human element. This is what you get at Toads, is um, those kinds of up close personal moments. And uh, it was uh, just one of the special nights of our lives. Um, yep. Bruce Springsteen, and that was also a surprise. Yep. Uh, he had played the Coliseum that night, and uh, it was John Cafferty Beaver Brown, right? Correct. So what did he do? He went down to the Coliseum? Yeah. John, uh, he played, uh, he was the lead singer of uh, Beaver Brown. They, they just called themselves Beaver Brown at the time. They, later on, it was John Cafferty and Beaver Brown. And he was um, basically the guy who um, was the front man and, and all that. And he was really into uh, Springsteen. His whole band um, were modeled after Springsteen's band. So he went down and, and he asked Bruce, um, somehow he got to talk talk to him and he asked bruce if he wanted to join him after the show and bruce uh, agreed um you know i'm sure john used his the same voice he uses all the time which is exactly like bruce springsteen's voice um he's, his movements his his etiquette every part of him is it was based on he turned himself into a to like a, a mini bruce springsteen so I, I think Bruce must have liked that, and um, he came down and um, he did about a half hour with him uh, when the show was over, and uh, that was the first super band uh, that we had uh, play, play Toads, and uh, uh, we were thrilled by it, and uh, it was the first of uh, many to come. Uh, John did the same thing with Bob Seeger, uh, maybe five or six months later, and uh, the same type of thing happened. He came up and he played... Uh, went on stage and jammed uh, with them and uh, that worked out great. And then um, uh, right after that, uh, as we got into in the eighties in, in, in July of 1980, uh, we finally got a full gig out of a superstar and that was Billy Joel. He was playing the Hartford Civic Center on the two nights um, on the Friday and Saturday. 
and he asked if he um, could come in and do a the first live digital recording on the Wednesday and Thursday. Um, he actually got into town on the Monday and he came down to see the Manhattan transfer and he was hanging around for a couple of days and, um, and then he started he did his he did his two shows on Wednesday and Thursday and they sold out immediately and um, that was uh, the first big one that did full full sets. When you two came in, those were full shows, but they hadn't broken yet, unfortunately. So we didn't really have many people in there. On the first two two uh, two shows, there were maybe less than a hundred people, maybe less than that. And uh, finally, the third show, we had a decent crowd, and then after that, they just totally broke. One of the fun things I learned in this book was that Mike Sperndle and his two partners were uh, graduates of the Culinary Institute of America which then was in New Haven. And uh, Mike Spurnell's ambition was to uh, be a, a French chef. And so Toad's Place really started as a, a French restaurant, um, but they weren't uh, making uh, much money at all. And then Mike saw all the Yale students walking around and realized this is what, this is what we're here for. These students want to come in, they want to dance, they want to meet women or men, and they want to dance to great music. So, um, the French restaurant didn't last very long, but why well, don't you tell us how um, how you met Mike? Uh, was your first meeting? With right. Mike? I'll give you a, a, a brief rendition. You'll have to buy the book if you want to see the full rendition. But I had a karate school around the corner, and uh, we were playing poker up there myself and uh, four or five other uh, guys that were also into the martial arts, and uh, most of them were students of mine. And uh, I heard a smash downstairs, and I walked down, we were, as I said, on the third floor above Cutler's record shop. And um, what, what did we find but a broken door and uh, my sandwich board was gone. So I said to the guys I was with, let's go take a walk around the corner and um, maybe walk one or two blocks and see if we can find the sandwich board. If we find that, maybe we can find the guy who broke the door. And, and those, in, in, in those days, I did not have, um, uh, I did not have, did not have a lot of money. And um, you know, I'll lie that one off. But um, there we go. I did not have a lot of money, so um, it, it you know it was a problem. And um, so I, we walked over to Toads. We walked into Toads, and uh, someone pointed out the assailant or the guy who who took the sandwich board there. So um, we were going to go after him. The guys I was with wanted to just do a number on him and just and just tear the place apart and. Uh, Mike Spurnell walked over to him and he said, "Hold on, hold on. Now we, we can um, we, 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 we can we can make this right." And um, and um, he said, um, uh, "Let me call the cops." So we called the cops, and um, we got the cops came, and um, we had the guy arrested. And I became um, friends with uh, with Mike after after that, and um, and. The, the rest is all history. It's just, we just grew from there. What was it like dealing with Mike? Because Mike, as, as I, we detail in the book, developed some addiction problems. He, he liked to drink with the bands. He had this great charisma, but unlike Brian, who learned not to drink on the job, Mike always was drinking on the job, white Russians and this and that, and then, he, then the drugs with the band members. And uh, he got to the point where uh, he couldn't function very well. And yet here he is, Brian, they're partners together and they got to run a club. So how did you, how did you deal with, with some of those tough years as, as, as Mike? Well, we, we were buddies and, um, you know, uh, when, we, when, when we were when told just closed, I would um, hang out with him and uh, we'd um, party and, and whatever, just because we were tight friends. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was great, you know, but then later on, things just got carried away with him. and. Um, unfortunately, and uh, things went down the wrong path. But at first, we, we, we were just great friends, and I would have done anything for him. And uh, I was I just wanted to see the business uh, become a success. And Mike had his vision, and um, w which was good. And he learned as he was going along, and I, I was learning the best I could uh, um, following suit. And um, every day we were here, we learned more and more and more about the business. And as it, as it expanded, um, um, we were able to um, make adjustments and expand with um, the entertainment business um, as it moved forward through the decades. Now, 
one of the things that's interesting is another reason why Brian has been able to survive all these years in addition to his hard work and his know-how is uh, he has no landlord. He is the landlord. He owns this place. But there came a time when a certain Ivy League university tried to uh, buy it out from under Brian and Mike. So how did you guys defeat Yale? Well, we we basically had a long lease on the property, and the, the women that owned it were the daughters of um, Kligerman, this guy Joe Kligerman, who originally bought the building back uh, in the early 1900s. He himself died in the mid 1930s, and he left everything to his uh, to his kids, and they were getting ready to um, go into uh, the final stages of, of, of their life. They were very old, and they just wanted to get rid of the building. And uh, because we had another ten years on our lease, so what, uh, what year was this, Brian? This was around 1984, 85, and uh, eight, more more closer to 85, just about 85, right? And we had another 10 years on the le on, on the lease, right? Because it was it had to be 85 because it went from his first the first part of the lease was 75 to 85 with a 10 year option to go to 95. That's what it was. So it was 85, and um, we we were trying to figure out um, you know our, our next step. So the women wanted to get out. So they said, "What do you want to do? We're, um, do you want to buy this? Do you um, you know we, we, we're, we're we're moving on?" So we said, "Yeah, we'll buy it." Uh, so we offered them, the, the building at the time was appraised at a million dollars. And um, we said, well, let's try to get this cheap. We didn't really know what was going on. And so we offered only 800000 And uh, unfortunately, the uh, lawyer for the woman was um, David Faulkner. And he worked for Wiggins and, and Dana. Uh, uh, there were attorneys who did a ton of work for Yale. So Yale was very interested in the property. So they came in and bid one million three hundred thousand dollars a half a million more than we bid but luckily when we um signed the deal um or when mike signed the deal with his partners i didn't sign it the, the original lease um they put in there that the tenant the tenants could have first rights of refusal and that meant that the, uh, if somebody else came along and their bid was accepted you have 30 days to match it and keep the building so the the Kligerman, Joe Kligerman, didn't necessarily want um, Gale or any large bodies to own the, the building. So he, he was insistent upon um, his heirs keeping this type of thing in the leases uh, that followed him after he died. Mm -hmm. So luckily we had it. So we had 30 days to find the money and luckily Mike and myself had the money. So we put that money up along with some closing costs um, so it probably cost us out of, out of pocket about 550 since the band would only loan us, a bank would only loan, loan us 80% on appraised value. So um, we had we had the money. Yale didn't think we had that much money. Um, between the two of us, we did. So we, we were able to, to, to keep the building and um, we lucked out and, um, and, and made it. That is such a David and Goliath story. And as someone who covered this town in Yale for many years. Anyone who's been around here knows that is very unusual for Yale to go after a property and not get it and just lose. Uh, and it's uh, benefited many people in this community, especially rock and roll fans, a decade since. So uh, I, I was very pleased to, to learn that story and, and happy to tell it. And also, also I should say, we're, we're, we are friend, very close friends with Yale now. Their president, Peter Salovey, um, is a great guy. He plays in a band called Professors of Bluegrass, and they've played here several times. So we are tight with them. We have no animosity with Yale at all. The students love it. And as I mentioned it to uh, Randy and his wife um, early, earlier today, and that um, we have put more smiles on Yale faces than anyone else in history. If you, if you add up all the smiles that people had when they were in here um, and during the four years that they attended Yale, you added them all up, it would probably be some astronomical number. And I don't think there, there's no one that could have come close to that number of smiles. I don't even know what it is. Yeah. You know, I, I'd only have to estimate it, but it has to be in, in, in the quadrillions. And also there are many people, I got some of them in the book, who uh, met at Toad's and became husband and wife later. And uh, 
Brian was telling crowded <laughs> Barnes and Noble Waterbury the other day that uh, you've helped, you think it's kind of helped create a lot of people because you know, all these marriages happened and things led to things. And right. many people out there who might not exist were not for toads. They basically, I'm indirectly, I'm, re I'm responsible probably for maybe 10,000 people walking around on the earth. <laughs> so all these, all these couples that, that met here, they had offspring, and yeah, about 10,000 is what I estimate. So I'm hoping that maybe some of the people watching us here today um, are can, can relate to that, and we're hoping that maybe some of the kids that are adults now and might want to just buy a book for that reason. Right, that's quite a legacy. How many people can say, <laughs> make this claim like that? Uh, well, who's your favorite, one of your favorite musicians? Yeah, I know you made always made a point to go backstage to talk to uh, the bands, even if they weren't really that, that well known, they hadn't mm -hmm. broken yet. But you always made a point to get to know them, develop rapport. Um, and some of them were, were really sweethearts, and some weren't. But uh, who, who, who were the sweethearts that you really remember that were your favorite people to deal with? Well, um, things changed over the decades. So I had different groups of people that I, I became really close with, and then they kind of um, moved on or whatever but uh, really in the early days um, we were really tight with bands like the sims brothers local bands that would play here before we started our dance parties and then we would cover cover music and they're on um, randy actually um talked to them um and and, and these conversations are, are in the book and um there were a bunch of bands like like that at the beginning that um would would come in on a regular basis and um, we would become friends with the bands um, like John Cafferty and Beaver Brown, who um, did a lot for us as well in those early days, and um, um, Andy Gundell with the, the Bluegrass Band. And then as far as national acts go, um, um, we, we did some national acts, like the guys from Aztec Two-Step years ago, um, whoever can remember them. We became friends, friends with them because they played here so many times. And um, I would we would just talk to him when the show was over, and um, um, just became good friends. And um, and then groups like NRBQ, of course, um, would play here. I I would estimate well over a hundred times uh, uh, easy over the years. They just played maybe um, three times a year, um, but each one of those times would be a full weekend. So that would really be six times a year. This will be two nights. They play a full weekend and fill the place up on, on both nights. And um, then as you move on, you know, we, John Valby and Marion Meadows um, have played here over the years and they're very, very close friends of mine. The guys from Deep Banana Blackout were, um, were here coming in here for years. And again, close friends of mine and um, as well as, um, others uh that um that did more than one gig and, and people that would open up to you um when their show was over uh and and you could sit down and talk to the guys from power of power were were always great just beyond words um um emilio and the funky doctor and all those guys from from tower of power just just really really nice guys and um uh, um just, just, just wonderful people, and um, you, you establish relationships with with these people, and you have your business side and, you, and, and your personal side with them, and, um, uh, and and you know you don't forget it, and uh, and and you you think about it, and you know that uh, you you'll take that relationship to, to the grave, and, and they don't forget it either, and that's why they want to come back, even if maybe they could fill a coliseum, but they say no, I'm going to go back to Toads because they treat me right, professional operation, and. Uh, they they booked us before we were big, mm -hmm. so uh, I'd like to see that kind of loyalty. That's right. Any not so favorite uh, musician, someone you would rather not have dealt with, or maybe wasn't so nice. <laughs> <laughs> there were uh, a few that um, were um, um, a little bit antagonistic uh, toward the club and um, people that. Uh, destroyed the dressing room or in, insulted me um, uh, in some manner or form. Normally, I just let it slide off on, and I don't, I try not to argue with them because um, when one argues with a fool, two fools are arguing. I think, <laughs> I think we all know that. So I try to um, get through it and uh, 
I know the next day will be better, but there are um, have been um, folks um, that um, have, have been rougher to deal with. Like, like I'm not not not, not to speak ill of the dead, but um, Warren would sometimes have Warren Zevon would have mood swings, and you'd have to deal with that. You know, the mood swings are a real thing, and um, you know he he was into certain things that um, would cause him, and he just um, would have those and I would, you know, I understood it and um, I dealt with it and uh, uh, it, it just was part of the whole thing. And one other band um, recently called me uh, just an old guy who should get out of the business. And it was just like, what, what are you saying? You know, and uh, it's just a nasty, um, pompous, uh, overbearing tour manager uh, who, who, um, just thought, um, you know, he could say anything he wanted. But yeah, we, we've bumped into um, a lot of these folks um, over the years. And normally we know it's it's a one night deal and we just don't invite them back um, to play, play, the, play the club. And um, sometimes um, it happens when we're having a sold out night. So, you know, I, uh, it, that, you know, it kind of works out at the end of the, end of the night because we're making some money and, um, uh, that makes it a little bit easier to swallow, but there, there are people on both sides of the coin, yes. Yeah, well, there are special nights. Uh, for instance, I remember John Fine played one night, and uh, he was. It, it, what is so, so sad is that you remember those great nights, and then you realize these guys are dying off. He lost John Fine, he lost Commander Cody recently, and it, it must be. A little difficult for you sometimes because you are older. You're in a young man's business, and you are appreciably older than a lot of these young rising musicians and the fans too. So, mm -hmm. but but somehow you've managed to do that. You've managed yeah. to, uh, in effect, stay young and relate to them, and, uh, and and keep it going, even though you're you're not their age group. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was telling Randy and, and his wife Jen uh, about uh, the Grammys. You know, and each and each night they have the Grammy Award once a year, they salute the, those folks that died the previous year. And this year there were 13 people, 13 that had played Toads. And that was, it was, you know, it was hard to watch. It was, you have that person, that person, that person. Oh my God, that person's gone now too. And you, you just um, say, yeah, you know, you see it because um, a lot of these folks lived a rougher life. Um, going up you know just I, I think i'm not sure what is the right word but um they were definitely um not coming out of a, a convent that's for sure you know and it, it takes a toll on you and when you hit your 70s and 80s um it, it, you know your body starts to uh give up if um you didn't take care of yourself the right way when uh, you were moving through uh, the years and uh, some of these guys just um they had a great time while it lasted and um some of them, you know, might might um, pass on uh, maybe a few years before um, they would have, but uh, that's that's what they wanted, and um, um, there's not much, uh, you know, that's just that's the way they wanted it to go, and uh, and that's it. Seems to me your biggest challenge the whole time you've been here was with, with the 18 months you had to close because of COVID. Um, uh, I was worried. A lot of people were worried. Can Toad survive? Look, all the restaurants are going out of business. Clubs have been around a long time. Nightclubs, they went out of business. Toads survived. So, how how are we able to do that? Well, luckily, I I um, I've had some money, anyways. Um, you know, I've had a, a a ton of equity in this building um, to start with, millions of dollars. So. Um, versus uh, other places that that are renting or uh, that have just opened up or uh, live from hand to mouth i didn't have that um that problem i had excess uh amounts of money um that uh um you know and were included in my portfolio so uh, i wasn't going to um go under but it, it wasn't easy but then the government came to the rescue anyways and um, with some large grants and um, help the folks in our in our industry. And um, that was a big, big help. So I didn't have to reach into my own pocket and uh, wipe, my, wipe myself out. Because uh, I really didn't, wasn't ready to uh, retire just yet. 
So um, those those things help out a lot. Now I can um, go on for uh, a few minute, few more years or as long as um, I remain healthy. Yeah, you're going to have the 50th anniversary before you know it. Time flies. And that's uh, right. What do you see for the future? And uh, when you imagine the next several years or mm -hmm. next five years, no. yeah. What do you what do you um, what do you figure is going to be? Uh, well, 50 years will be a big mark for us. We did the 50 year um, anniversary party for Sally's, and that was years ago. And that was a big mark for them. And uh, now, all of a sudden, I never thought we'd get there, but we, we finally got there. And uh, this will be our 50 year anniversary in three years. And January will be 47 years. So we're going to have a, a huge celebration for that. And I'll bring back a lot of the bands you haven't seen here um in, in a while and you haven't seen them because a lot of these bands are older and they hold out be, and for the big bucks because they can't do what they did when they were kids and, and go from night to night to, to town to town it just doesn't work for them that way when when you get into a um, an older age you just don't have that energy to do that anymore so i'm going to see if i can yank some of those folks out um out for that year because it's such a big mark uh, I know Tower of Power just had their 50 year anniversary uh, a year or two ago. Uh, I'm going to try and get those guys back. Um, I think um, I should be able to if um, everything is okay with them. And uh, a few of the other groups that, um, that that played here so many times that um, like countless times, like NRBQ and even Blue Oyster Cult and Joan Jett. And some of those folks played here so many times. Uh, Marshall Crenshaw, we were looking at his um uh, he played here 13 or 14 times and there's so many of those bands that played here time and time again that we're gonna i'm gonna try and bring all of them back for that 50 year anniversary um and um if i have to pay a little bit more that'll be fine um i'll save up and try to get it back for that year and um and this way some of the older folks uh that haven't been coming out to toads we'll see if we can get it set up um for you so we'll have more We'll, have a, we'll bring our capacity down and have more seating for you and so you can come in and, and relax and enjoy yourself and um and, and watch the concert in comfort um rather than uh, uh the way you saw it before um which might have been a little bit tighter and more more acclimated toward a, a younger person well now you mentioned sally's sally's pizza and uh a band it was provide a band is Brian likes and they're, they're doing well. We'll get the Sally's Pizza backstage delivered, and they they know they've made it when they see the Sally show up. But how come it's Sally? There's never Peppy's. It's never modern pizza. Well, What's we we established a great relationship to start with with Ricky. Um, Ricky Consiglio is a really close friend of mine, and he was of Mike's as well. And you know he you know he has his brother. Um, uh, Bobby and his sister, um, and um, his mother was, who passed on, Flo, and uh, sister was Ruth. And um, but Ricky was really tight with all of us, and just a great guy. And uh, we're both we're both pilots, so we both have that um, um, common between between the two of us. And um, because of that camaraderie, um, he he was always there to um, stay a little bit later and make those pies as the last pies in the oven um before he closed up and he would often bring bring the pies by himself and um drop them off and uh the band would have them for when they finished uh playing they'd still they'd still be warm and just the their family is just a great family and um they're they're, they're still um healthy and I, I just saw ricky the other night and um just a great guy and um a relationship that we will we won't forget sometimes advance of unusual requests you would think the Ramones, for instance, they'd uh, want uh, a lot of beer or hard liquor or something backstage. They're more tough guys. Um, mm -hmm. They seem to have that image uh, out of New York. Uh, but no, what did they want backstage? You who? <laughs> you who talk <laughs> things. you will keep parents' favorite. Yep. <laughs> uh, so go figure, right? Uh, so what was the deal with them? They just don't, they just never, they don't like alcohol? I, you know, I never really delved into that, but I have a feeling that um, in their younger days, they may have um, indulged a little bit too often. And I think they just decided among them, themselves to take the business of um, being the Ramones more seriously and focused. 
and decided to um, not not imbibe in alcohol um, or, or anything like that. So Yuhu was the uh, the drink of choice. And unfortunately, um, after their last gig here, which was uh, in the mid '90s, I think '96 maybe, um, they three of them died, uh, unfortunately. And uh, it was, I was really sad to see that happen. But they three of them passed on, and um, one of them. Uh, um, is still alive, and uh, he he wrote a book, and uh, um, just a great bunch of guys, great tour manager Monty, and um, um, just somebody, a group that I won't forget. It just I will not forget that group. Mm -hmm. Well, how hard is this job these days? Are you working as hard as you used to? You you seem to be working many many nights, even even now that you're back up and running, um, but. Generally, uh, how late do you <laughs> you work at night? I mean, it seems to be your like two, three o'clock in the morning, or are you pacing yourself? I, I yeah, know. well, I I still work late. Um, I, a lot of nights I'll have my general manager Ed Dingus uh, um, um, just take over the floor, and uh, I'll try to get out of here a little bit early. Uh, um, but I, I am I'm usually here late. That's the way my body clock works now, mm -hmm. and um, uh, like Saturday, it was uh, just a huge night for us. The Saturdays are always very busy, and um, it, I didn't get out of the place until uh, 10 minutes to 5 in the morning. Uh, by the time we, we finished with all the stuff we had to do, it just, just took a long time. And um, sometimes it does, and sometimes I'm able to get out of here early. And uh, Ed um, handles uh, the floor um, well, and he can cover every night if, if needed. So as I get older, Ed um, can slowly... Um, um, do do what's necessary to keep uh, the place in operation. I'm going to interject right there. Um, we have some comments and questions coming in from our, our guests here. And a former employee, um, a Charlie Molson, says he worked at Toads from uh, 77 to 82 and <laughs> says, Brian Phelps is about the hardest working guy I've ever met. He was there till closing every night and was never messed up. And that dude has iron energy. Well, thank you. Uh, Charlie Molson, who is a great guy. His real name is Charlie Hunter, but don't tell anybody that. <laughs> he uh, used to drink Molson's hair. He was had to be the greatest artist I've ever seen. He he could do up, a, sometimes he would do up our chalkboard. We didn't have a lot of things available to us in those days. And Charlie was a Yale student. And um, he would do up a chalkboard and, and the blink of an eye that would look like a masterpiece, like something like uh, one of the masters uh, artists uh, uh, in, in his, of history had, had done. And he would do it. And uh, it, was, it was like, holy my God, this is incredible. And um, he, was, he, was our, he was here during his stay at Yale. And um, he was a great guy. Hopefully, um, he'll contact me um, here at the club because I'd, I'd love to talk to him. Uh, I'd love to see him again. If you can make it for our book release party, that would be really good, which is on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And um, I know a lot of people um, have missed him over the years, and we still have a few people here that would remember him as well that still hung on. But um, you're talking to a guy who's got uh, a genius level IQ, and um, as I said, one of the one of the best artists that that I could comprehend, and uh, just a great guy um, and uh, overall. Well, he approves of your answer, Brian, and he also wants to know if your office is still in the basement. I have, uh, <laughs> I have one in the office, but I normally work out of the second floor now, and it's just there's more light up here, so I'll work down there. Um, sometimes, uh, if I'm settling up with the band, normally I have Ed settle up with most of the bands now, but if it comes to a night when I have to, we'll try to settle up down there. But not even even with the bands, I'll, a lot of times I'll bring them upstairs now. So I, I spend a lot less time uh, in, in the basement, which is uh, that office is next to the dressing room, also known as the green room. And uh, um, just less time down there. OK, um, a comment from one of our guests. She says her husband and her met at a Toad's Place dance party in 1984, and they've been married for 35 years. That is great. That is absolutely great. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Randy uh, interviewed a bunch of people that met at Toads and got married. And uh, th that, as I mentioned earlier, 
that's one of the greatest things that um, I could hear, you know, that, that especially that they're still married, you, you know, um, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a mark in itself. And um, now that um, they're around, I'm sure, I'm, I'm not sure if they have any children or I'm, I have a feeling um, maybe they had a couple of them, but um, yeah, it's a, it, 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 it helps to, um, it just, just helps make the whole idea of this institution um, um, uh, overall uh, more warmer and more uh, people friendly and um, than just the building um, doing shows. It, it just brings the community in with us um, that much closer. Um, a question on Toad's Place itself, what is the square footage and has it increased since you originally opened your doors? Well, we, we increased it by making more rooms available. Um, we opened up Lily's Pad upstairs and um, we added on our rainforest room, which is part of the building next door, um, which increased our, our, our square footage capacity. We have roughly um, uh, about, um, uh, was all in about 13,000 square feet. And um, it's, it's big enough to do um, what we need to do. Um, where did the name Toads come from? <laughs> um, that's an odd, it, 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 believe it or not, the, the answer is as odd as maybe the name is because all I could ever get out of, out of uh, Mike Sperndl and um, his partners was they sat around one day and they decided uh, they thought something about couch potatoes um, were uh, called toads. So why don't we make, let's, let's call it toad because that's a good name. I, I didn't catch the, I never really caught um, how that came together. Why couch potato, why, why you'd want a couch potato to be the name of the venue, but somehow they had, they, there must've been some other connecting uh a language in there that um, that made it happen, but um, it did. Well, they were out of Ohio, and so they uh, there's the uh, you know, different parts of the country have different uh, lingos, and uh, back, he said back, back in Ohio, that's that was if you were say I'm just going to be a toad tonight, I'm just going to hang out in, indoors and be a toad. And uh, Mike Spernal and his buddies came out of, came out of Ohio, and so they knew full well what a toad was, and uh, his first wife said, you can't name a restaurant, a French restaurant, Toad's Place. And he said, trust me, people will remember it. It's going to work. <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> um, oh, did you know that Toad's Place is mentioned in author Jody Picoult's book, The Book of Two Ways? No, I not heard that. No. I did not did not know that. What I didn't know that either. That's so Let's cool. Hear more about that reference and what what it says. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, yeah. That's good. That's yeah. Good to hear. What were some of the great female acts who came through? We had a lot, uh, a lot of acts. Of course, um, Cindy Lauper, Vicky Lee Jones. Oh God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's so many. I'm, you know, as Cindy. Uh, a uh, blondie and oh god yeah Bl uh, debbie harry um great joan jet um if, if, you know and um patty smith. oh patty smith uh, without a doubt i mean there's stories about these people that we just mentioned in the book so you have to buy the book to get the complete stories of these great women that played the club because i have stories of a lot of them in-depth stories that will, will bring a smile to your face so you have to buy the book to see the the detailed stories of um these these women that are fantastic artists um um lucinda williams was another one we have a story about her in there yeah, you know I, I won't go into that now you know and uh, another great uh great artist and uh bonnie red has been here um several times in the 80s before she broke uh uh broke it uh open with um that album um right at the, at the at the at the end of the 80s right and she won all those Grammys, mm -hmm. and so she was here and we had a great time with her and uh, just so many so many um artists that are out there had benatar started uh her first tour here 
Uh, nobody really knew who she was, and uh, she was great. And we have a little, little tiny story about her in there as well. Um, and she actually got interviewed when she was big and doing coliseums by People Magazine. And what shirt did she wear when that happened? A Toad's Place shirt. I think you already guessed that. But Pat Benatar um, wore that shirt. And just like one of the guys from U2 and, um, and one of their um, uh, um, news, newscast uh, promo pictures, um, they wore a Toad's uh, T-shirt in that as well. And uh, But women, uh, yeah, we've had uh, just so, so many a uh, great and outstanding uh, female artist uh, coming through here that um, it's um, really amazing. And we have, you have so many fans on right now, people that have frequented Toad's Place over the years um, and, and are asking for backstories on the people that they've seen perform. Um, and we're at eight o'clock already. So I just, I, I have to say again, the book is the best way to read about these stories of on and off stage, uh, the performances, these incredible artists that you've had at this legendary venue. Do you have a picture of the book there? I don't. Do you? I, I have one right here. Let me grab it. Hold it. Yeah, grab that so you, you all can see this, this amazing cover, this book release. We're so excited for it. Thank you for your interest. Yeah, it, it, is, it is an iconic place, and uh, what what the cover shows is what you see outside on the awning. Yes, and it's uh, there. It it's is nicely uh, rendered. Well, Peacock did a nice job with this cover. It's perfect. Yeah, it's uh, it's, uh, it's uh, well presented, and uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. And with the promotion that you are all offering with the keychains and the t-shirts it's a great time to not only purchase the book for yourself but then you purchase a couple for the holidays that are right around the corner and they're great gifts so um don't forget it's two or more books will get you the keychain three or more will get you a toad's place t-shirt and the offer expires at 11:59 tonight eastern standard time and i'll, and I'll even tell you right now that if you run out of shirts, I'll get you more if you need them and keychains. So there's no limit uh, on that. So you will not run out of them, no matter how many people order. You rock, Brian. <laughs> We're very happy to hear that. Um, everyone, the legendary Toad's Place, it's out now. Stories from New Haven's famed music venue. Signed copies. Get your, your copies while supplies last online or in store at RJ Julia or Wesley and RJ Julia, Randy and Brian, thank you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure to host you both tonight. Thank you for having us in. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Happy reading and have a great night. Thank you.